Hola, comadres. This is Marcy, your host of Comadreando Podcast. Um, today, we have a very special episode. We're joined by one of my amazing guests, and her name is Ayana, and I'm going to let her introduce herself. Who are you? Hi, uh, my name is Ayana. Uh, most people know me as Phenomenally Autistic, and I am an autism advocate. I'm autistic, and I'm an artist, and I mostly speak about um autism awareness and acceptance for um, black and brown autism people because I feel like when it comes to autism um, we're over we're often looked over and forgotten about like we're not here and I feel like um, when it comes to autism um, they sometimes intentionally make it so that you only think about little white boys and that's not the case um, there are black and brown autistic people as well. Amazing. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing um, to raise awareness in the community. Um, so the I like to give my the the my listeners like a breakdown of how I met my guests. And um Ayana and I got connected through social media because of Rick, which is one yes, of the guests. I love them. <laughs> from the Women Club podcast. Um, Rick had interviewed Ayana last May, and he was like, I know who would be like an amazing guest for your show. And I'm like, who? And then he told me all about you. And I was like, oh my God, I love her. And then like he gave me your social media profile, and I was like obsessed. I was like, oh my God. I was like, she's like slaying. You guys have to, I'm going to put her ID in, her, in the show notes. But she's like slaying, you know, like, completely fashion model like <laughs> besides doing all the all the work like you can tell that she's an artist because she has like such a great sense of style um so today's topic is autism in adults and the reason why I wanted to kind of talk about the topic besides the fact of like we're going to touch on advocacy as well but the reason why I wanted to talk about it was because you know I was just kind of curious about what the experience is like for people on the spectrum as adults because you know I have a child on the spectrum Ayana I don't know if you know but yeah my son Aiden um he's 13 he's gonna be an adult you know in a few years so I want to know kind of like what it's like for you and um you know to give other moms on the show kind of a glimpse of what it could be like or you know how we can help our children get ready for the future so you said you have autism yes um, um ASD that's my diagnosis um I do have um some you know developmental delays as well like I'm not on the intellectual level as my peers but um I do believe that um your child can still, you know, live a full life. Um, maybe not like, you know, they're as not in the way their friends can or like their siblings or their cousins, but in like a way that they can, that they can still enjoy and that you can still enjoy. Um, and like, it's not like the end of the world. So, um, you know, I enjoy my life. Of course, it's challenging. But I'm still able to do all the things that um, I set my heart to do. Like if I set a goal, I'm still able to do it. But there are just a few extra obstacles in the way. But, you know, like when there's an obstacle course, people get through the obstacle course. But they're called obstacles for a reason. Mm -hmm. So um, there are challenges, but you can get through it and you can work through it. Um, it's just a little harder, but when you go through things that are hard, it just makes you stronger. Yes. Um, so I want you to kind of tell the audience, how was it that you found out that you were on the spectrum? Because um, from my understanding, you were not diagnosed as a small child. No, I found out because like I was in the hospital and like because I have a seizure disorder and which is common for um, people who are autistic because um, autism is a neurological disorder and mm -hmm. seizures are neurological. So I was there for that. And um, they noticed that I was different. Um, I was uh, a little withdrawn, not really speaking to my doctors. Um, most of the communication um, with my doctors was my dad speaking to them. And, um, you know, they asked my dad, like, did I have like... Um, you know, any type of intellectual disabilities. And he just said that, like, um, I was a very um, withdrawn child. 
Um, so then they were like that they wanted to like um, evaluate me. So they brought like a team in. It was two two women. And it was a very very long test, and um, they let me take breaks, and because I was getting a little frustrated. <laughs> So they let me take breaks and um, they at one point spoke to my dad and asked him, how was I as a child? Um, he, he And he told them, he was like, you know, with me, everything is like black and white thinking. Um, things are fair or unfair, um, that I was very, very honest. And, you know, so sometimes people thought it was just me being rude, but it wasn't. It was just me being honest. Um and then, like, a couple of days later, they just came and they sat down and they spoke to me and my treatment team. And they were like, yeah, she's on the spectrum. <laughs> so that's how I found out. So it was kind of like an accident, but um, it was also a relief because, you know, I've always felt different. And people knew I was different, but they didn't know why. And I didn't know why. Yeah. So that test that you had, was it a neuropsychological evaluation? Um, I really don't know what it was called, but they were just, they, they were kind of like, I, I think it was because they were kind of like testing me for everything. And I honestly just, I just thought they were going to like say I was bipolar. And from like speaking to like other autistic adults that I've met, um, like on TikTok, they, they, a lot of them told me that before they got an autism diagnosis, they were diagnosed wrong and they were like diagnosed for being bipolar. Wow. So that's what I thought they were going to say, but mm -hmm. no, they didn't. <laughs> yeah. So my son, my son did the neuropsych evaluation and he got super frustrated. Like he like spazzed out on the doctor. I was just getting he frustrated on, because like. <laughs> he knocked on like everything on the shelf and we had to leave and come back. And then I had to come with like a behavior plan for him to like be able to sit through it. Cause it's a lot of hours. And yeah. I it was see how so it could be frustrating. <laughs> and then all these weird questions, like they're like, Oh, um, I'm going to tell you a story. Tell me all the things you remember. And you're like, what? It's yeah, like and then they 50 have these, different things you have to list they're like, off. Look at this picture for five seconds and draw it. I was mm -hmm. like, I like to draw, but I don't remember what was on that picture. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then like having that instant recall, like, and then, and then you feel weird. Cause you're like, am I supposed to remember every detail in that picture? Yeah, I didn't. I was just like, uh, and then like <laughs> some of the stuff, like I'm guilty because some of the stuff they asked me to do, I just refuse to do it. So yeah no that's and that's okay listen man like uh, i get it it's an examination but at the end of the day like if you don't feel comfortable and you don't feel like doing it i don't feel like you should be forced to do anything you don't want to do yeah and um, that's like like mm -hmm. another thing like i try to like explain to people now like after like learning more like about myself and like things you should and shouldn't do to autistic people because like at one point like people were trying to like force me to do things that like you shouldn't like force autistic people to do like forced eye contact like that that's not something that you should do because there's a reason we're not looking you in your eye so I'm just like do you know that you can cause a meltdown <laughs> so I just like there's a lot people need to learn yes yeah, so I'm a special education teacher too and I noticed that my students even if they're not looking at the board or whatever I'm teaching they know exactly what's going on mm -hmm. so the eye contact really is like is really not for you guys, like not for people on the spectrum. It's more for the person, the neurotypical adult or person that's speaking to the person so they can feel comfortable because that's like the type of interactions that they're used to. So I never like force my students. I'm just like, okay, it's fine. If you want to sit like with your back to the, to the thing, as long as you're paying attention in the way that you feel comfortable, that's fine. Um, but yeah, like it, like that kind of, that kind of behavior. It's so like, um, what is it? Ableist? Is that what they call it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, ableist be like reinforcing ableist tendencies on on people that are not don't, that that's not their norm, you know? Yeah, and like what's really sad, like some parents of um like autism and differently abled children, they're ableist themselves. So that that's really sad. Yeah, and it makes some kids feel like they're I mean, obviously they are different. Not everybody's the same, but it makes them feel bad about their differences instead of like empowering them and making them feel good about themselves. Um, so how was that for you emotionally? You said you felt relieved. Was there any other emotions attached to it? Or it was kind of um, like, oh my God, yeah, this it was, is why. It was a whole bunch of like emotions. Like first, it, it was like, um, 
Okay, I'm going to try to explain it the best way. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, it was like, it was a relief because I was like, okay, well, now you know why you're the way you are. Now you know why you're different. Now you know why you communicate the way you communicate. Why you know why sometimes you can't communicate. But I was also like embarrassed. And then I was like, because you you still hear jokes about like autism and um Mm -hmm. so like I didn't tell anybody for a while like my dad knew and I knew Mm -hmm. but like I did I wouldn't tell anybody for a while because just because of the things that I I heard about autism and also like you know when I say that like people never really associate black people with autism I was one of those people so I really didn't tell anybody for a really long time so like my emotions were all over the place so for the first few years I didn't tell anybody like if I saw something, like if I was on Facebook and I would see something about autism, I would share it here and there, but I really would never like say that like I'm autistic and I really didn't start speaking about it until like the end of 2019 because um, when I wasn't accepting it, I was hating myself and Um, at some point I was just like, okay, well, you know, it's time for you to start loving yourself. So when I accepted it, I started to love myself. So, um, and loving yourself is a good feeling. So that, that's, that's when I started to accept it. I started to love myself. Yay. I'm happy about that. Um, so, so now like the, so the the stark difference now is like, now you share that you are on the spectrum, like Mm -hmm. upfront. So when you meet a group of people, you're like, hey, I'm on the spectrum. Right. Most people, yeah, most people know now. Like some people don't agree with like um, telling people when you meet them that you're autistic. Um, But the reason like most everybody that knows me now, they know. But if it's somebody that may not know, like we will tell them because um, if I can't mask, if it's a day where I just don't have the energy to mask or like I might rock back and forth or you know like people might be like right is she okay she's gonna like slap me (laughs) so like we do it just so people are more comfortable and like they don't think like I'm being like rude or inappropriate because I am very honest like like a few weeks ago I told my dad he needed a mint but I wasn't saying it like a way that like he didn't brush his teeth he just like ate something that I couldn't tolerate the smell because mm-hmm. my my smell is just like the sensitivity. So like that that's what I mean. Like I'm being very honest. So we tell people so everybody's more comfortable and they don't think I'm being rude or inappropriate. So that's why we tell people. But some people don't agree with that. But you know, everybody has their own opinions and their own beliefs. So I wanted to ask you, um. Because, you know, we, we get a lot of, like, I've read a lot of research about um, sensory processing disorder, right? Which is something that a lot of people with autism deal with. And, um, like, what does it feel like when you, like, I know I have a very hypersensitive nose. So for me, certain things will, like, trigger me to, like, gag. Yeah. Like, <laughs> you know? And there's other things, like like, certain sounds. And, like, sometimes I'm, like, I wake up and, like, the lighting is not great and it's like it'll bother me so how does that feel like in your body like do do you feel it like is it like a feeling not like just a, like a like not just like uncomfortable not just being uncomfortable but is it like something more um well I can try to explain it sense by sense so like my light sensitivity isn't really that bad you know I'm sitting in a ring light right now is it too bad um, but sometimes I do have to put my phone on like night mode all day um, just because it's just a little bit too bright. And um, like even sometimes like clothing will like over like stimulate you and make it, it it'll make me physically nauseous, um, loud noises um it, it's, it's it's more like like an overstimulation that can make you physically nauseous for me like it affects everybody differently but I wear noise canceling headphones um I do have taste sensitivities I don't eat a lot of foods um it, it's for a lot of the foods for me it's not really the taste it's like the texture of the food mm-hmm. that I don't like um with the smell sensitivities 
I am very sensitive to that. Like, I'm super sensitive to that. Um, so it, it does differ for everybody, but it's just like our sense, senses are just like magnified. Um, like if I don't like somebody's cologne and even if it's like faint, like other people won't smell it, like we don't smell anything. And I'm like, well, I can't deal with this. So like, it is, <laughs> it is different for everybody, but it, it is just like an overstimulation and everybody's body reacts differently yeah. to it. So sometimes it, it can make me like physically like nauseous and like, so it, it, it's different for everybody. Mm-hmm. But it's just so, like like sensory overload. It just it just like feels like all your senses are like crashing. So what do you do when you get overloaded like that? Do you like have like a like a game plan? Like okay, I'm gonna do this to get myself back to center to like you know get yourself back to your your baseline. Um, most of the time, like um, I'll have to like go somewhere by myself and sit down, and um, I like to meditate because I found that that helps me. So sometimes I'll just like put my noise canceling headphones on um, and I'll meditate. But if I need to do like a guided meditation, I'll put my AirPods on and I'll just like meditate for about 10 or 15 minutes because um, one of the coping skills that I learned because I um, do CBT therapy. So one of the coping skills that they actually taught us was um, meditation to learn to be mindful Mm-hmm. So um, just being mindful in the moment grounds me. So that's one of my coping skills. And I learned that like that really helps me. That's awesome. I love that, that you take mindful moments for yourself. Um, yeah. All right. So let's get into the nitty gritty because I know you. a lot of people do things that really like get on your nerves. I was listening to some of the shows that <laughs> and that's OK. Listen, I love it because like you're real like. That, like I feel like some people need to be more real. I I I, I find fault in people that are, are like, you know, they're smiling in your face, but then their intention is not what they're showing you, right? So it's like a different intention behind it. So I I get annoyed at people like that. But um, what are some of your pet peeves um, about being a, an adult on the spectrum when you do decide to share with people? Like, what are what are some things that people do that kind of, like, really get on your nerves or that you just want to be like, hey, stop that um, crap right now? Well, <laughs> the first, like, what I said, like, if people find out I'm, I'm autistic, they're like, well, you don't look autistic. And I'm like, okay, well, what does an autistic person look like? So that exactly. is something that, that is something that irritates my soul. And then, like, um, if somebody finds out that I'm autistic, they're like, oh, you're autistic? I saw Rain Man, and I'm like, okay, well, I'm not Rain Man, and every (laughs) autistic person is different. Like, it's called a spectrum for a reason. Mm -hmm. Like, if you met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person, because everybody is different. So that that irks my nerves, and then Mm -hmm. people are like, oh, well, you can't be autistic. My nephew's autistic, and he doesn't act like you. Okay, well, I'm sorry. I'm not like little Johnny. I'm Ayana. So, like, those are some of the things that, like really like (laughs) really get on my nerves like those are just a few yeah like they they tell me that all the time they're like oh he's he doesn't look autistic i'm like what is like what are you what are you supposed to look like or people yeah go ahead go ahead sorry or people that say like um like all autistic people are geniuses and i'm just like well actually that's that's kind of not true. There are some autistic people who have savant syndrome as well, but that's not all autistic people. And that's kind of like an unhealthy narrative to push yeah. because it just makes the people who are not those things feel like they're not enough. So that bothers me too. Yeah, like the media portrayal of people with autism, like, like you know, I love the shows like The Good Doctor and, you know, whatever all these other shows um but it like pushes a narrative that people on the spectrum are like these like highly functioning like just awkward like socially awkward people yeah which is not the case for everybody you know yeah and i like the good doctor not just because sean is autistic um i like it because they show his like they really really show like his um his autism traits um not too crazy about them showing him having savant syndrome but I like the show because they're inclusive in other ways. Like they've had transgender actors on and um, 
actors with other that are differently abled and um, amputees. So I, I like that show, like, for other reasons. But, yeah, they always, um, I don't think, like, um, the entertainment industry does a good job. Like, I, I like Holly Robinson, Pete, but I don't think that, like, the movie that she did with the autistic, um, having the autistic son was, was, um, yeah. a good representation because they started the movie out by like telling him, but I do appreciate that they did use an actor who was actually autistic, but they mm-hmm. started the movie out by trying to force him to look them in the eyes. And I'm like, don't they know that that can cause a meltdown? But I was just like, yeah. okay, you know, they're trying, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like I've, I've met so many different people in like all, all arenas of the spectrum. And like, just like you said, like not every person with autism is the same. Like, not everybody has the same comorbidities or like you know little quirks or things like that so it's it's i just wish yes display the people with savant syndrome right but also show people that are nonverbal and are like functioning at a high level or 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 that are functioning not that you know that they're living their lives being nonverbal too because i feel like they don't really represent yeah, People and also like, cause like you know me, obviously I'm I'm verbal, but I do have nonverbal episodes, mm-hmm. and select mutism, and like people, um, sometimes think that like just because you're having a nonverbal mm-hmm. episode, that means you can't communicate. You can still communicate. You can write. You can text. You can communicate with an iPad. So I think people forget that, or and they also forget that nonverbal people um not all but some can still hear you and understand what you're saying so you know yeah. watch what you say they have because receptive language <laughs> people can be like really ignorant and i don't think that they do it on purpose it's just like not what they're used to mm-hmm. i had a student that um well she wasn't with me but this was like i was in a school that was like for students on the spectrum but like it was like an artistic school so all the kids were like doing like different like um plays and things like that but there was one student that was happened to be nonverbal, and one of the teachers in the school was talking smack about her in front of her with another teacher and she happened to hear and then later on that day on her ipad she told her mom what the teacher said so it's like you know just because somebody doesn't have expressive language doesn't mean that they're not understanding what you're saying or that it's not hurtful what you're saying you have to be very cognizant of the things that you say to people and how you express yourselves and even like even body language because like I feel like body language is a big thing and 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 I feel like people on the spectrum are more not sensitive like they're they can they're more aware of body language and and social cues in that sense you know so you you guys can tell like my son can tell like right away if somebody's not is like faking the funk <laughs> yeah and like back to like teachers the, yeah. the mistreatment by teachers like even though I was undiagnosed as a child um I actually had a like really bad encounter with a teacher a substitute teacher choked me um when I was like in third grade because I what? my regular teacher she knew that I needed to learn a little differently than everybody else. Mm-hmm. So she was used to me like asking questions or needed things explained a little differently and she was fine with it. But this substitute, she just <laughs> she was just sick of it. So she she ended up choking me, but I didn't know that it was wrong. So I didn't tell my my parents, a friend of mine told my parents so like I put a post on TikTok and I I told my followers I was like if you have an autistic child instead of asking them how was their day ask them how do people make them feel because a teacher choked me but I didn't know that it was wrong but I knew I didn't like the way it made me feel so um and even sometimes now as an adult I don't know if people are mocking me I don't really I don't really understand sarcasm. So people can say something to me and I'll just answer the question because I don't know they're being sarcastic. So, um, you know, and a lot of parents was like, wow, this is like just such good advice. I'm going to start using this for my mm-hmm. child. And then, um, you know, there, but there are like a lot of Karens in the autism community. And one lady Girl. was like, well, my child doesn't understand his emotions. And I was like, okay, I'm sorry, but I'm just giving a suggestion because some mm-hmm. ch- children do 
And again, this is just my experience. And I didn't say it was going to work for everybody. But, you know, when you don't agree with them, they just lose their minds. But, yeah. Let me tell you something. Jail. I would have been in jail. (laughs) Well, we've never seen her again after that. Oh, my God. Bro. Oh, my goodness. Even as a teacher, though, like I see other teachers say like stuff that's out of pocket, and I check them real quick because I'm you're not about to do that, not in front of me. Yeah, like, and my dad really doesn't play. She got fired, and like she's lucky that like I won't say it, but she's just very lucky. (laughs) Mm -mm. No, um, all right, so let's switch gears a little bit. So, what do you do? I know that you were a choreographer before, right? Yes, I was a choreographer. Yeah. Um, now, like, um, I'm an artist. Um, I have illustrated 17 children's books and released four coloring books. Um, I just re-released um, my 2019 coloring book, We Are Magical. Amazing. I love it. Um, so the books that you write, what, like, what are, do you talk about um, being on the spectrum or is it, like, just different topics? Um the the ones that I've done in the past, like I actually I authored a book like a long time ago. It's not in print or anything anymore. Um, I didn't know I was autistic when I put that book out. Um, but I do have a children's book coming out. It was actually supposed to be out last year, but I kept changing things and changing my mind. And mm-hmm. <laughs> the last change that I'm actually making, though, is the cover. So hopefully it'll be out in a few months. Yeah. Um, and it, it actually does deal with autism. Um, so this will be my second book that I am authoring. Um, and it's it's more about like what you can do when you're different than more about what you can't do. Mm-hmm. So, um, and my coloring book is more based on like, um, just, you know, black and brown girls seeing positive images of self because I don't feel like, um, there was enough and I just feel like everybody deserves to see people that look like them in a positive light because you don't always see that. Yeah. Even in the school community, I was talking to that about that with, in another episode that I didn't really see myself represented when I went to school. And um, even in the media, you know, I'm Latina, but the Latinas I was seeing were like, you know, straight hair, blue eyes, you know, blonde almost. And I'm like, I'm like, I, I used to honestly question myself, like, am I ugly? Like, why why I don't see anybody that looks like me and even the teachers that were teaching me there was a bunch of like Caucasian people and like the only other teacher of color that I knew was my mom because she came from the Dominican Republic and she wasn't even teaching at the moment you know she had to get um her degree again but you know I feel like representation matters and the fact that Mm -hmm. you know I'm a curly hair Afro Latina and I'm in the school system and I go and I show up as my authentic self helps out. Yeah, lot like that's girls. how I feel. Like before like I lost all my hair, like this is like the wig that's like the closest to my texture. Like I didn't see like a lot of um, you know, curly head characters really anywhere. Like even Barbie, all the Barbie dolls were just they were just like painted black, but they still had like straight hair and I'm mm-hmm. just like Where's the Afro puffs? Where's the curls? So. Yeah, like my hair doesn't look like that. <laughs> <laughs> right. And like, you know what I didn't understand either? And this is like no shade to like my mama or any of my aunts. Like, you know how like for like Easter, you had to get your hair straightened. But I was like, well, why do I have to get my natural curls blown out just to get it curled by a curl and iron? That never mm-hmm. made sense to me. But I but at and least the thought, crown act was just passed. Yes, I'm happy about that because, like, <laughs> like let let okay, we live in New York, right? Which is not, it's a little bit more diverse. Even though, like, there's certain areas in New York, you know, it's they're heavy. Like racist. where I am in Westchester County, they're racist. Oh, bro. But like I'm saying, like, there's certain parts of the United States that is not a problem, but there's other spaces that you go, and even in New York, I feel like I was working in the corporate and um. I was like suggested to blow out my hair because it looked more professional, kind of like the same concept of the Easter thing. Like, oh, you look more put together. Like, what the hell? My curly hair isn't professional. What What are you talking about? You know? So, yeah, it's important. I feel like 
you know, you standing in your truth and being your most authentic self is something that we need in the community. Um, you know, so I love the fact that you're like an author and that you're like pursuing and doing the things that you love. That makes me so happy. Um, yeah, art, like, yeah, believe it or not, art has like always been like my main form of communication mm -hmm. um, because I didn't speak much as a child. Um, like I said, I was very withdrawn and people would always be like, what's wrong with her? And my parents are like, well, there's nothing wrong with her. She doesn't want to be bothered when you leave her alone. And, you know, I would always go like find some place where nobody was bothering me. Um, and, and I would draw sometimes if I didn't want to speak, I would draw a picture. My parents knew um, that that was how I communicated. And so they always kept me involved in some type of art. Like I always say this, I'm like, art like saved my life and I don't mm -hmm. know where I would be if I didn't have art yeah. um it's a part of my identity um my aunt put me in art shows at seven years old I went from that to doing theater and then um then dance and then back to theater so I've just always been involved in some type of art and people are like well how did you do theater and you're shy I'm like well I'm not shy um but when you do theater, you don't show up as yourself. You show up mm -hmm. as a character because, you know, sometimes being different, you want to disappear. Mm -hmm. And when you do theater, you are disappearing. You're disappearing into a character. So art has always been like a very, very big part of my life. So um, I've, I've always drawn and I've always um, been involved in some form of art. So I'm, I'm actually about to join like a... Um, probably a theater house out here in Westchester County. That's awesome. Um, I just had to, I don't have an immune system, so <laughs> I just had to wait for like COVID to like that die happened. down a little bit. Yeah, like somebody can stare at me too long and I'll get sick. <laughs> oh my gosh, yeah. So I'm, that makes me really happy. So like that is like your, that's like your joyful place when you're creating. Yeah, yeah. I love that. So what kind like, of music, uh-huh, okay. I just, I just like to create things, um, I might not be saying anything verbally, but if I'm creating something, I'm saying something. Yeah. So um, what kind of music do you usually choreograph? Like um, they, we used to do like hip hop and modern. Um, it all depended. Like they were invited to like so many different types of events. Um, so we kind of like went to like, went with like the event, like, um, I'll just say, like, I'll just use, like, a modern, say we were doing it today, like, we wouldn't go to, like, a Martin Luther King celebration and dance the Cardi B, so, like, it all, <laughs> it all depended, even though I like her, it all yeah. depended on, like, the event, so, like, they kind of did a little bit of everything, like, um, they were on, like, 106 in Park, and, um, oh, wow, they've been on ABC Family, um, they did the Apollo, um, they danced at the United Nations because I was honored there. So they, they really did a lot. Wait, so what age groups were you were you dance were, were you choreographing for? Was it like um younger um, children? I started at I took them as young as three years old and I went up to um some of my students were only like two or three years younger than me. I was very young when I started. Mm -hmm. So I took them up to like age twenty one. Um that's why, like, I see them now, and they got kids and stuff, and I'm just like, oh, my God. <laughs> but um, I took them at three years old. I, I didn't expect to take them so young, but um, parents would, like, approach me or bring the kids, and I'm just like, I can't turn them away. So that's Aww, how that happened. That's so cute. I love it. Okay, so besides the – sorry, I live in here. Okay. It's wild here. Okay, so besides the meditation and the art therapy, what else do you do for self-care? Um, well, when I wake up in the morning, um, you know, I, I brush my teeth, I wash my face. Um, and then, like, before I really, like, get my day started, uh, oh, besides taking my medication, I take, like, 40 pills a day. <laughs> um, I, I write in my gratitude journal um, because, like, I really do have to live in gratitude. Um I've survived over 300 seizures, and if you're not grateful wow. for that, I yeah. mean, you 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 gotta live. You have to live in gratitude. So I wake up and I write in my gratitude journal. It's very very full. I probably need another one, 
but um <laughs> because like i feel like anything that you tell the universe you're grateful for they'll give you more of so you know i'm, I'm i always say i'm grateful for my life i'm grateful for my family um i'm grateful to be able to do the things that i love so um gratitude is a big part of self care um you know i love to create um i like to hand paint on clothes i do that like any form of art is also self care for me um creating i love to read um i i've been doing more of audiobooks lately because i've had this like migraine been harassing me for a little while but um so i love to read um what else do i like to do i like to binge watch tv shows <laughs> And I like to like rewatch the same show over and over and over again. <laughs> yeah, there's a sense of comfort in that. Like sometimes when I'm like, because like I feel like this part of the podcast, like part of it is like creating. You know what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, I record the episodes and I have to like edit them. And I'm like, am I gonna watch a new show that I don't know? No, I'm just gonna rewatch something that I already know. And also like, and I also do that though because the first time I watch a show. Um, you know, I can't completely process what happened and what's going on. So um I have to like and I had need subtitles. <laughs> but yeah. like the first time the first time because I, I was trying to explain to some parents, um, I was like a guest on this panel and they were like, Well, can you tell us why our kids always watching the same show over and over again? And the way I explained it to them, I was like, Well, you know, me the first time I'm watching it. I'm watching it for sight, and the second time I'm watching it for sound, and by the third time, you know, our senses are just all working together, and then we can enjoy it, and then if we like it, we're going to keep watching it and watching it and watching it, and then, like, the first time we're watching it, since, like, like me, I, I kind of don't like surprises, and with TV shows, you don't know what's coming on, those are surprises, so kind of gives you a little bit of anxiety, so once you know what's going to happen, you can relax and you can watch it, so that's how, like, how how I explained it to them. That's cool. Um, my son, he loves to watch the same thing over and over again, but then the, his thing, his thing is, Ayana, he likes to, um, he'll watch a show, he'll put the audio of another show and record a new video with the visual of, a, of the other show. So that's like his little um, creative piece. That's like what he likes to do. That's um, cool. <laughs> <laughs> he's really funny too. Um, what was I going to say? So I love the fact that you actually make time for self-care because I feel like a lot of the time we're always like in this go, go, go mentality. And regardless if we have us, you know, we're neurotypical or, or you know, neurodivergent, I feel like self-care should be at the forefront of everybody's day. Like, you know, yeah. make time for yourself and take care of yourself. Cause like, there's no way that we can pour into somebody else's cup when, when we're not, we're depleted. Yeah. So Ayana, I'm going to get a little personal. Okay. Um, so I know you're dating age. Are you, is there a special person in your life or do you date? Um, not right now. Um, only because like, um, I'm dealing with like a lot of health issues and like, I just don't think it would be fair to like, not be able to like, um, give my like, you know, all. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's kind of a nightmare too <laughs> because of like my communication issues. And, um, you know, like if like, say I went out on a date, um, the eye contact thing, why are you not looking at me? Yeah. Is everything okay? Um, the food sensitivities, did you not like your food? Why are you not eating all your food? A touch aversion. No, you're not kissing me before the date is over. So it's just like <laughs> it 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 is challenging and you really have to find somebody understanding. Yeah. Um, if they don't already know that I'm autistic, it's like, okay, do I tell them? Is that gonna run them away? So mm -hmm. um it is a bit of a challenge. So like right now that is like not something that I'm actively doing. Okay. Um be because of mostly because of my physical health. Um, but you know, when I was, those were the challenges. And when I start again, I know those will still be the challenges, but you know, we'll see what happens. So what's your type? Cause you know, um, we, we don't know if we have some single men out there. That are um, well, I'm like, this is like, I, I used to do this on purpose, but like, you know, my dad is an activist. He, um, 
he speaks up, you know, um, he speaks up for like against police brutality and things like that. I actually got my name because of his activism. Um, if you want to hear about it, I'll tell you, but, um, (laughs) so like when I was like a teenager, I was like, well, I like white boys. And I think I was just like rebelling though, because now I don't like white boys. Um, (laughs) um, I like, I, I would probably like someone who is an artist like me, but if not, you know, that's fine. But you have to want to go to an art show with me. I'm going to drag you to an art show with me. Yes, yes. But, um, of course, um, kind, respectful, um, like I can't, I can't be in a relationship with somebody who like doesn't have like basic respect for other humans. Yes. So my thing is like, you have to know how to treat people. Um, you have to be kind, you have to be respectful. And those are like the, the, the basics for me. Like, how do you treat your mother? If you have children, how do you treat your children? So for me, it's more like a like a characteristic thing because if you're ugly on the inside I don't care what you look like on the outside so yes. that's that's for me that's my thing so um okay so back to my name um <laughs> unless you want to know something else no no it's okay you can go ahead oh okay so um I was actually named by um Muhammad Aziz and um he was um, one of the men framed for killing Malcolm X. Um, mm. And as you know, he was exonerated, I believe, in November. Um, but don't yeah, quote November me on that. this year. Um, and how this came about is um, my dad was visiting him in prison. And, um, you know, he said to him on one of the visits, he said, um, your wife is pregnant. And if she has a girl, name her Ayana. And, you know. He had a girl. She she had a girl, and she named me Ayana, which means a beautiful flower. So that's how I got my name. Oh, cute! I love that story. Thank you. So, are you is, is your dad so close to him, or are like they visit with each other? Um, he they haven't spoken since he's been out of prison. Mm, okay. Yeah, it, it like it was that whole thing, like the whole conspiracy behind that. I went into a TikTok rabbit hole and like research rabbit hole, and it was just like my brain. And, and it's just like people. I mean, like really, they spent decades in jail, and it was just like people. Like sometimes I read about like people's conspiracies, and like my brain starts to hurt. It's a lot of information, and then like when you just start, because it's like it starts etching away at like you know that surface. Once you get, like, deep, 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 like, my brain starts hurting, like, literally, I have to, like, put it down or, like, walk away for a little bit, because I'm just, like, yeah, it's too much. And then you start questioning everything, and you're, like, well, is anything even real? Um, yeah, so, okay, what else? Hmm. Okay, I wanted to ask you, if you could give the parents advice, because I know you talk to a lot of moms, and you've done a bunch of interviews with different moms, like, what advice would you give them to help support their children or what advice could you give them to like help the moms prepare them for like adulthood? Um, I always tell the parents um, to not limit their child and to not allow others to limit their child and to definitely not let their child limit themselves Um, because um, being diagnosed as autistic is not the end of the world. Um, you can still flourish and you can still live a full life. Um, just like I said before, it's just going to be a little different and they're just going to be um, a little, a few more obstacles than, than others. But um, I, I think everybody has challenges in life. So you just, your challenges are just going to be a little bit different. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so... I want to thank you so much. This was such a good sh- um, interview. Um, is thank there you. anything else you wanted to share about yourself or anything um, else? I think you asked really good questions. <laughs> thank you, Ayana. Um, so with that, comadres, I'm going to close out the show. And I want to say what I say all the time, which is follow me at Comadreando Pod on IG. And you can follow Ayana on IG at, you can drop your handle. Phenomenally Autistic. Mm-hmm. And she has a TikTok and she has a, a link tree, which I'm going to put in the show notes as well. 
And if you have any questions for me or for Ayana, please feel free to send me a comadregram uh, via email at comadriando at esctheNetwork.com or slide up into my DMs. And I want to thank you all for spending uh, the afternoon with your comadres. And with that, good night, everybody. Bye.